Uh, hello and welcome to the Theatre Cafe. My name is Nathan Matthews and it's my great honour to welcome you here this afternoon for a very special Q&A with the cast of Allegiance. Uh, before we get going, uh, I should say that uh, if you want to take any photos or videos, make sure you tag us. It's at Allegiance B-Way, at Allegiance B-Way uh, on TikTok, on Twitter, on Instagram. Uh, we'll have a few performances, as most of you probably heard, the soundtrack for... Um, quick show of hands, who here has already seen the show at the Charing Cross Theatre? Yay! Um, well, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, Allegiance is an amazing true story inspired by the amazing Mr. George Decay. Um, and I'm so glad that the three stars of the show, Ayn Rand Frey, Telly Leung and Mr. George Decay are with us today. Guys, welcome to the Theatre Cafe. Thank you. And uh, George, I know that you're quite the Anglophile, so how's it going at the Charing Cross Theatre and how much are you enjoying being back in London? We are third. Oh? No, I don't think. Okay. Switch. Yes, this is on. Thank you, Jelly. Uh, we are having a great time here in uh, London, enjoying London as well as. Uh, the Charing Cross Theatre, and what's unique about the Charing Cross is its intimacy. We've been uh, playing uh, Allegiance since uh, 2010 when we started, and they've always been in large theatres. But this one is not only intimate, but smack dab in the middle of two audience groups. So it's uh, both challenging and touching, literally as well as heart touching the heart. And so we're enjoying our stay here thoroughly. And I should say a huge congratulations because both audiences and critics are going wild for the show. It must be so heartwarming to get such a phenomenal res uh, response from audiences here in London. It is, because, and I think it's because of the intimacy. Um, the British audience is uh, famous for not uh, responding, and certainly, you know, in uh, America, the... Uh, Standing ovation is almost traditional. Every performance ends that way. But it's happening here in this intimate theater because, I think, of the intimacy, the connection that we make. And so uh, for us actors, wouldn't you agree? It's very, very gratifying, satisfying, and enjoyable. And this is your West End debut? Yes, it is. <laughs> At 85 years old, wow. and uh, I've been coming for a long time hoping for this. I first came to London in 1960, which, when most of you were not born. <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen London change. I remember Piccadilly Circus when it really was a circus. Yes. Traffic sp uh, spun around it, and Leicester Square had automobiles roaring on it. I'm grateful for that. Uh, it, it's so much nicer to have a plaza. But now you also have these stunning buildings soaring up into, uh, from our apartment. We can look across the, uh, the uh, Thames and see this elegant streamlined spearhead shooting up called the Shard. Yeah. And uh, my husband's going to be having a birthday coming up this month. And he's, we're going to celebrate that from the top of London, oh, wow. the top of uh, the Shard. Uh, Telly, this is also your West End debut, and I know this is something that you've been wanting to do for a very, very long time. Yeah, I, I've done concerts here before, uh, uh, and uh, I've performed at the Hippodrome, I've performed at uh, Crazy Cops at Zadell's, and that's actually how Nathan and I know each other, because I've appeared on Nathan's radio show a couple of times to pr promote those concerts, but this is my first time doing a run of a show here, and it's been such a phenomenal experience. The, the main incentive was that I wanted to come here and work with British theater artists and actually like get into rehearsals and 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 rediscover this show that I know so well, but with a whole new crop of artists and a new community. And um, it's been the best time. It's been amazing. Ayn Rand, is this also your West End debut? Yes, this is also my West End debut. I love this. Um, so George, this is a a really personal journey for you. This story. It's it's something that that you have lived through and, and you are the inspiration for the story. So do you want to tell us um, why it's so important that this story is seen on stage? 
by telling us a bit about that story. Uh, this is based on a chapter of American history, but it is so relevant to our times today when uh, a whole political uh, event is based on a lie. Uh, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, it was a terrifying uh, event. Over 2,400 people were killed. Over 300 uh, aircrafts were destroyed. Over er, uh, exactly tw uh, 20 ships were sunk, eight of them major battleships. And the, a devastation and a terror of that swept across the, uh, the Pacific to the West Coast and rolled across the country. The nation was terrified. And there were Americans that looked exactly like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor, us, Japanese Americans, and they became fearful of us with no basis in fact. Japanese Americans had nothing to do with Pearl Harbor, and yet on the street, like what happened uh, in, uh, during COVID, uh, Japanese Americans were spat on, yelled at, called ugly names, graffitis were uh, uh, drawn on our businesses, our homes, our farms. My father's car had three letters uh, painted in red, J-A-P on it, and the political leadership got swept up in the same hysteria. They came down with a curfew. Japanese Americans had to be home by 8 o'clock at night and stayed home until 6 a.m. in the morning. They froze our bank account. My father uh, went to the bank the morning after the first curfew, and he had no access to our money. Some families lost their entire life savings. We were financially straitjacketed. We couldn't pay the mortgage in our home, so we didn't pay it. But the banks knew that that was the reason for th that they could eventually take over our, our home. So it was a chaotic time, and... The rationale was that we look like this. The amazing thing is the political leadership failed. We had an attorney general in California who, he's the top lawyer of the state. He made a, an astonishing statement from Sacramento, our capital. He said, we have no reports of spying or sabotage or fifth column activities by Japanese Americans. And that is ominous, that word ominous, because the Japanese are inscrutable, that prejudi prejudicial racist uh, stereotype. And because we can't tell what they're thinking, it would be prudent to lock them up before they do anything. Lock them up before they do anything. So for this top attorney, the absence of evidence was the evidence. And this uh, thinking went all the way to Washington, D.C. and the White House. My father was an admirer of uh, Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt because in, during the, uh, uh, the uh, 30s, when we had a devastating uh, economic uh, depression, when Hundreds of, of thousands of Americans were going hungry, jobless, homeless, lining up in long lines for a bowl of soup at, with their spirits broken. To bring the economy up, the president needed to galvanize the nation. And he said to America, there's nothing to fear but fear itself. But after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt realized that he had the entire West Coast open and vulnerable to an attack. And he himself became fearful, and he got swept up in that uh, a frenzy frenzy of, uh, of uh, uh, locked him up before, uh, without evidence. And he signed Executive Order 9066 on February 19, 1942, and ordered all Japanese Americans on the West Coast to be summarily rounded up and placed in 10 barbed wire prison camps in some of the most desolate, godforsaken places in the United States. 
the blistering hot desert of Arizona, the sultry swamps of Arkansas, which were our family was eventually sent to, the cold windswept high plains of Wyoming, which Allegiance takes place at, uh, the uh, two of the most desolate places in California, to be imprisoned there. So this is what Allegiance is based on. And you were just five years old when this happened. I was five years old. How vividly today do you remember that, that moment when the guards came to your door? One would think over an 80-year period, there'd be a lot of mists on that memory. But that May morning in 1942 is one that is seared into my memory. My father came into the bedroom that my brother and I, Henry and I, shared. He dressed us hurriedly and told us to play in the living room while my parents did some last-minute packing in their bedroom. Our baby sister was in a cradle uh, in their bedroom. And in the living room with nothing to do, Henry and I were standing by the front window just gazing out at the neighborhood. And suddenly, we saw two soldiers marching up our driveway. They carried rifles with shiny bayonets on them. They stomped up the steps of our porch. Our window was looking right down on the steps. And they uh, thumped across the porch and with their fists began banging on the door. Henry and I were petrified with fear. My father came out of their bedroom, answered the door, and literally at bayonet point on my father, they said, get your family out of this house. My father gave Henry and me little boxes tied in twine to carry. He hefted two uh, heavy suitcases, and we followed him out onto the driveway and we stood there waiting for our mother to come out. She came out, escorted by one of the soldiers, with our baby sister in one arm, a huge duffel bag in the other, and tears were streaming down her cheeks. I will never be able to forget that May morning, and in part it's been uh, embedded by the frequency with which I, I, I tell this story. And one of them was uh, to a congressional commission in 1981 when they held hearings to, get, uh, to gather all the information on the uh, imprisonment of innocent Americans of Japanese ancestry. And I testified there about this uh, May morning and the impact that it had on the rest of my life up to 1981 when I testified. The com commission came up with a report which said that the internment was uh, based on three factors. One was war hysteria, two, racial prejudice, and three, failure of political leadership. This report uh, went to the, the White House, and in 1988, President Ronald Reagan, formally and officially as the President of the United States, apologized for that uh, uh, imprisonment and authorized the payment of a token redress of $20,000 to people who were still alive, the survivors that were still alive in 1988. In our family, my father was the one who bore the pain and the anguish and the rage and the loss the most. But he had passed in 1979 too early to know that, that there would be an apology. That would have been so much more meaningful to him than the yeah. old token. So your, your life experience has now become the subject and the inspiration for Allegiant the Musical. And am I right in thinking that it was a chance meeting uh, during intermission at, uh, in the Heights on Broadway that led to the idea of it becoming a stage show? Actually, it began the night before. Yes. Brad and I are theater goers, mm -hmm. and uh, that night we went to see Forbidden Broadway. Yeah. You know, a very witty uh, 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 takeoff on the 
popular uh, musicals. And uh, there were two uh, guys seated in front of us. One of them recognized my voice. That was Jay. He turned around and said, you're George Takei, aren't you? <laughs> and we had a little chat about Star Trek and other uh, Broadway plays. And, uh, and during intermission, we chatted a little bit more. And we went back to our apartment saying, uh, uh, those are really passionate theater lovers. We, did, we did, really didn't know, know them by name then. The next night, we went to uh, see In the Heights. We had aisle seats, and uh, then we looked down the aisle, and this time, not in front of us, but in the same aisle, about in the middle of that aisle, were the two same guys, and they were waving at us, <laughs> and there were people uh, between us, so we waved back, and the play started. And near the end of the first act, the father, who has a beautiful and smart daughter who wants to go to college, but the father can't afford to send her to college, has a, 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 a number called inutil, a, a, in Spanish, useless. He feels totally use, useless because he can't uh, help his daughter, a bright daughter who shows so much promise, uh, uh, let her uh, go, to, uh, go to college. And listening to that song in Util, this loving father, reminded me of when, as a teenager, I had many after-dinner conversations. I, I became very curious about my childhood uh, imprisonment, and we had conversations. My father was a block manager at both camps that we were in, and he shared with me uh, both his feelings and what he did and some of the challenges that he had. And he said one of the things uh, that, that really pained him was to see his two young boys playing near the uh, barbed wire fence. He had so much hope and aspirations for his two boys. Uh, the, the girl was a baby yet. <laughs> and to see the barbed wire and the, his two boys just tore him apart. Yeah. And listening to this uh, Puerto Rican father sing about his sense of uh, Im impotence uh, got me, I, I, I'm what's known in the theater as cr a crier. <laughs> <laughs> when I start uh, getting worked up and welled up, I feel this elbow. <laughs> Brad's kind of elbowing eat me like this. And uh, what, he, what that does is just make me hold it back in more. And the more I hold it, it's like water building behind a dam. <laughs> Eventually, the point comes when the dam breaks. So it's not just a sniffle, it's but a... a <laughs> <laughs> it's so embarrassing. And I, I feel Brad moving away from me. <laughs> well... Telly, you've been involved with Allegiant since 2010, and I think a lot of people don't realise just how long it takes to get a musical to the stage. You were part of the original production in San Diego, Broadway in 2015, and now here in London. How much has the show evolved, and how different is the London production to the original Broadway production? Well, if, if we're going to look at the evolution of Allegiant from 2010, the show is radically different. Um, and yes, for, for all my friends who working on a brand new musical takes a very long time to actually get on Broadway. In fact, I, I would consider Allegiance actually pretty quick from the very first reading I did, which was in 2009, 2010, to being on Broadway in 2015. That's actually pretty fast. There's some shows like The Visit or Spring Awakening that's taken 10 years, 12 years, 14 years, right? So, um, but uh, it's, it's fascinating. I remember Sammy used to be, you know, 17 years old and couldn't fight the war because he had asthma. You know, um, he, he only sang one song in the whole show, we you know, mother. and I had, a, I had a mother in the show, I had a brother in the show, yeah. they've been cut from the show. Streamlined. Yeah, so it's, it's um, there have been so many changes through the years. Um, the show is, but then we, you know, settled into sort of what the show was, I think around San Diego, especially when we brought on Marcus Cito as our book writer. Um, and, then that, and then we kept changing and fixing that really all the way up until a week before press week on Broadway, the changes were fast and furious. You know, huge lyric changes, cutting numbers, cutting scenes, all of that, up until we froze the show a week before opening night. 
And that week before is usually when the critics come and you want to sort of freeze the show for before the New York Times shows up, right? Um, and um, I would say, you know, the show on Broadway was beautiful. You know, we're at the Long Acre Theater. It's 1,100 seats. But also there's all of that expectation of what it is to be a big commercial Broadway show. $13 million, you know, 16 in the orchestra pit, projections and automation and, you know, people riding in on pallets on the stage. And all of a sudden now you're here at the Charing Cross Theater and it's 300 seats. It's in traverse. It's very intimate. And I think our director, Tara Wilkinson, has done a phenomenal job. So Tara has been part of the Allegiance journey because she was the associate choreographer on one of our very first workshops. The first time you sort of leave the 29 hour reading phase and you sort of put everyone on their feet and get everybody, get everybody off book. It was the first time we added a choreographer to the mix and she was very much a part of that. And she said, listen, I only know it from that phase of it because eventually when the show got to San Diego and Broadway, we, we, had a, we had a change in staffing and a different choreographer. So she left the project by then. She says, but I only know it in the workshop phase where you know a piece of paper becomes 10 different things and this crate becomes furniture, but can also become luggage, but can also become a train car. Like that's the only way I sort of know the show. So she's like, that's my reference for it. So that's sort of what she's bringing back into our version at the Charing Cross. And it's this beautifully intimate, theatrical, simple staging of it where this, it's all about story. It isn't about the 16 musicians in the pit and the automation and the, and the palettes and the, and, the, and the projections that happen. It's actually purely focused on story and, and script and score. And I think that's the sign of a great show because if you can strip away the chandelier and the yeah. revolve and the car and whatever it is and still have a great piece of theatre yeah. because the story you can create, things like you said, the moment in the show, if you've seen the show, you know what I mean, where suddenly a train appears, it's, it's harrowing, but it's so beautiful at the same time. That's the sign of a great piece of theatre, I think. There's also a great story that I, I heard you tell about um, the original production with no, it's right. Don't worry. Um, uh, Leia Slonga played the role K that Anne Rand, you're playing on Broadway. Um, and that there wasn't a song for her. Oh, yeah. And you really felt that it needed it. And the writers were sort of pulling their hair out, trying to find a moment. And then suddenly they hit upon it. Tell us a bit. That song, I mean, so uh, K. And we're going to hear some of it. Yes, K sings a beautiful song, which I'm, I'm going to preface, preface by saying I, I sings it beautifully eight times a week. And it's wonderful. But, you know, when we were doing the show out of town in San Diego, the, the show is in a through, it, many times it's in a through sung sort of style, but we were all like, come on guys, we have Lea Salonga in a show, we gotta give her a song. Do you know what I mean? And oftentimes that's what happens when you develop a show from the ground up. Lea was part of the readings even before I started in 2010. She was part of readings in, in California in 2008 and nine even. And so, um, you know, they, they write for you when you're part of something for so long. So much of Sammy is built on strength, my strengths as a performer. And then all of a sudden they were like, we have Leia Salonga. People are gonna come to see Leia. They want, we want just a song where she's center stage and she gets to sing her heart out. So they figured out how higher out of town in San Diego, there wasn't, they sort of figured it out during rehearsals. So it was nothing that we did in workshops, nothing we did in readings. And sometimes some of the best material gets written under pressure. When you're like, oh gosh, we have a paying audience, our first paying audience of a world premiere in a week. And I think it really was like a week before we started tech that they wrote higher and they said, here it is, Leia. And she learned it as fast as she could. And she's incredible. She's like a computer. I don't know how she does it. But, um, but she learned the song and then stopped the show. And it kind of feels like in the same way as the, uh, the campmates that were interred having nothing and finding beauty in, in the smallest of things, the writers of this show suddenly at the last moment when they were despairing, they suddenly found this beautiful song for Kay to sing. And you get the, the pleasure to sing it eight times a week. And I have to say, it's absolutely beautiful. It, just listening to her sing it, I closed my eyes on press night and it was like I was listening to Leia. Thank you so much. I can't give you I tried. than that. Let's quickly introduce the characters that you play. And because you're kind of the sister, but you're sort of the maternal figure in the show, aren't you? Yes. Um, do I have things right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so basically, uh, Kei Kimura is, um, uh, yeah, the the maternal figure in the show, and what she's done all her life is just to was just to take care of the whole Kimura family, and then suddenly she finds this uh, fire in her, and she she starts to do the things that she actually wants to do, and she finds the that confidence. And throughout the story, we kind of see quite a conflict within the family, which is actually something that 
very sadly is very true and, and still to this day there is conflict within Japanese families and communities in that Sammy Kimura, who you play Telly, um, felt that it was his duty to enlist, whereas Kay was kind of really worried that she could potentially lose her, her brother in this process and then other characters have sort of differing opinions and, and so the story is very much about this family and their their opposing beliefs as to what is the right thing to do because they are Americans, aren't they, Telly? I mean, we are, I mean, that's what sort of politically divided the Japanese American community at that time is so sort of what we are seeing today. We are living yes. in very politically divisive times and it's hard to, you know, and it's hard to say who's right and who's wrong in those situations. We just don't agree. And in Allegiance, I think you see the Japanese American community split there are two very different definitions of what patriotism means and what it means to be American. And unfortunately, this political disagreement ends up breaking apart this family. And, and you find out at the very top of the show, there's no spoiler alerts, but you find out at the top of the show that this brother and sister have not spoken for 50 years. And the, the show is sort of you, is the unfolding of why that happened and, and ultimately the, the reconciliation of that. And we should say that despite the fact that it's a very um, dark hour in American history that is the basis of this story, there is a lot of joy in the show. There are a lot of uplifting moments. There's a great range of musical styles as well. So it is the, despite the fact that they were, uh, am I right in thinking that you were interred for two years or was it longer? I beg pardon? How, how long were you interred for in total? Oh, uh, uh, five years. Five years. So despite the fact that you had spent so long in this, not interred. Turned. That means buried. <laughs> <laughs> Completely different. Um, there was a lot of joy to be found. There were, there were dances. There was the baseball team. There was so much about finding hope in, in such darkness. Well, I, I, we all just went through the most isolating time of our lives, I would think, right? Like during COVID. And think about, yes, it was very lonely and very isolating. But, you know, I, that's sort of my new point of reference when I worked on Allegiance again. You know, working on Allegiance pre-COVID and working on Allegiance post-COVID was a completely different experience for me as an actor and as an artist and you think about this community finding beauty from nothing you know so and I, when you do research about the, the art that was created there is some beautiful woodsmanship and craftsmanship that was and paintings and things that were made and jewelry that was made during this time by those Japanese Americans it, that were interned and I think it was because they out of that emptiness of not having their normal lives they had to they, there was a need to create and I think both of these characters find a part of themselves because of that experience so yes it's a dark chapter and it's a terrible thing that happened to this community but in that emptiness was also opportunity to find something that they probably would not have found if life had just continued and I know that I know I discovered many things about myself during COVID that I said gosh if I didn't have this time to sit still and think about these certain things there are parts of me that I don't think I would know if I didn't have that time George music and dancing are organic to, was organic to the internment experience. My father was a block manager in the two camps that we were in, the one in Arkansas and then the segregation camp for disloyals in Northern California. We hear the echoes, the resonance of the word gaman throughout allegiance. Gaman on the surface is endurance, fortitude, but embodied in that word is also the reason why we endure, the reason why we survive. My father said Gaman also involves the strength to see beauty, find beauty under harsh and ugly circumstances, to make your own happiness. Telly talked about the artwork the uh, craft work that's done. And also, my father was a baseball player in San Francisco uh, before the war, a, a Japanese-American team. And the San Francisco team traveled around the Bay Area playing other Japanese-American teams in Palo Alto, San Jose, Oakland, uh, etc. And uh, he uh, proposed building a... Uh, baseball diamond in part because that was his passion and but he said that's the way to bring the community together and he, so we went to a, a cheer for cousin joe or uh uh, uh akita's uh, father is pitching so we all went to root for them to build a sense of community 
And so the music and the uh, dancing is organic to the whole idea of internment, the idea of gamang, to survive for a reason, to be human, to live as a human being. Well, it's all this detail uh, from your own life experience that I think give, uh, gives Allegiance such authenticity. Um, and to have George as a member of the company, for you as the, the company as a whole and as individuals, that must be really important and, and something to be cherished to be able to have George in the company in London. I always say working on this show, you know, and having George, and I'm going to talk about you and gush about you a little bit, um, is that um, if I, I feel like I am doing an okay job if, if I'm doing right by George, somebody in the company that actually lived this experience and, you know, and, um, and, and is that litmus test of authenticity that, we're, that we are the, of this story, right? So I always, you know, I always check, I do, I check in with George and I go, am I, am I would, would he be proud of the job I'm doing? Is he happy with the way we're telling the story? And, um, and, and I always sort of check in to make sure. Um, and I think that's also what's created such a beautiful, you know, through the years, such a beautiful company. I think I, I, think I can speak for everybody who works on the show in the last 13 years that we've all felt that way, that we want to honor not just your story, but the story of the other 120,000 people that experienced this with you. Well, to praise you, after our curtain call and we go off together, I always tell him, well done, well done, good show. <laughs> well, um, please join me in saying a huge, huge thank you to the stars of Allegiance, Aaron Ferrer, Telly Liam, and George Sakai. <laughs>